The 90s gets a bad rap as far as horror movies go. Without the 90s, we would have missed out on such films as Candyman, Scream, and the original It miniseries. I mean, let's be real, all of us of a certain generation hate clowns now because of that show. Thank you so much, Tim Curry. <laughs> One thing that the 90s did have going for it was the re-emergence of the slasher boom. See, in the 80s, you couldn't walk into a video store without being overwhelmed with slasher movies. Everyone was trying to cash in on the good will that 1978's Halloween had given us. When Friday the 13th showed us that you could cash in on slashers in a big way, we ended up getting flooded with slasher content. Of course, for every My Bloody Valentine or The Prowler, we also had an Offerings or The Phantom of the Mall, Eric's Revenge. The 90s slasher glut was no different. When Scream hit big, another group of imitators sprung up as every studio wanted to cash in. Thus, you end up with some quality films like Urban Legend and I Know What You Did Last Summer. But sadly, as what happened in the 80s is the quality began to slip and the overabundance of slasher films began to get tired and boring. Even some sequels to the better ones see this fatigue, and as is the case with I Still Know What You Did Last Summer. So maybe it's time to re visit this sequel and see how it not only fails its predecessor, but also fails in any modern sense whatsoever. Nice hearing from you, Carlos. In I Know What You Did Last Summer, a group of teens are partying on 4th of July when they accidentally hit someone with their car, and instead of calling the police, it's decided to take the body and throw it in the ocean. A year goes by and everyone starts to receive notes saying, I know what you did last summer. Oh boy, I usually only get this excited when they say the title of a movie in the movie. They're soon picked off one by one until a final showdown between two of the teens, Julie and Ray, and what is revealed to be a fisherman in a slicker that uses a hook to kill his victims. The teens do get the best of him, but the only thing that can be found after he's thrown into the sea is a hand with a hook on it. It was inevitable that a sequel would quickly follow. When presented with the script for the second film, director Jim Gillespie decided not to return. He felt the story wasn't up to the original and frankly made no sense. So instead, director Danny Cannon would take over the directorial duties and filming quickly went underway. And just a heads up here, the film will fully be spoiled in order to discuss what happens during the movie. Jennifer Love Hewitt and Freddie Prinze Jr. return to play their characters Julie and Ray. A year after the events of the first film, we find Julie at college with her new roommate Carla. Ray has decided to continue working at the docks back home, but the two are still together. We find out Julie had been having nightmares about the fisherman, which explains the cliffhanger ending of the first film where he bursts out of the mirror to attack her. Carla wins a radio contest and is awarded four tickets to the Bahamas that following weekend. Kind of a quick turnaround, but okay. Julie wants Ray to go, but after a talk on the phone, he turns her down. Instead, Carla invites their friend Will and her boyfriend Tyrell. They get to the Bahamas only to find out that it's the off season because it storms constantly. The fisherman shows up once again and begins to take out the hotel staff one by one until no one can help the group. And they are now stuck on the island. The killings continue until Julie has to finally have her showdown with the fisherman. It's revealed that their friend Will is actually the son of the fisherman from the first movie. They both work together to get them to this island to kill them as Ben the fisherman used to work there. Whew, there is so much to unpack with this one. I remember seeing this one in theaters and being so disappointed. My hope was that with the rewatch for this video, it would improve. It did not. Let's run down some of the problems with the sequel. The idea to get the group to this island is needlessly convoluted. First, Ben enrolled his son in the same college as Julie, then Will had to integrate himself into her friend group, and after all that was settled, they called randomly to the girl's apartment claiming to be from a local radio station. They had to answer a question about the capital of Brazil, which, by the way, they got wrong and they realized it was a setup later. Okay, but now they have to hope that Ray won't go so that the group can invite Will and he can be the one with the other ticket. 
Uh huh. And once they're on the island, they have to hope that a bad storm will shut everything down so that no one can go to or come from the mainland. Then they gotta hope that no one else has shown up for the off season raids at this specific island. That is a lot of stuff to have to have line up to get your revenge. They just as easily could have had Will say that he won a radio contest and tell everyone he's taking them on a trip. It takes out some of these ridiculous variables. And throughout all of this, Ben must have have some deep pockets. Tuition for his son to attend class and then cover an all expenses paid trip for four to the Bahamas? I mean, that's not cheap. They know where Julie lives, so if they want revenge, couldn't they just show up to her apartment and kill her while she's asleep or something? And I know the argument then is that we wouldn't have a movie, but an idea with a lot less plot holes could have solved this idea. Some of these characters are also grown worthy through a modern lens. Jack Black's dreadlock stoner guy is the absolute worst. His constant pushing of weed on people gets old really quick. We get it, you like weed. Even from the era that brought you Jay and Silent Bob and Dazed and Confused, this character is pushing it really far. His death is not a sad one, and it wasn't sad to see him go. And the horny back and forth between Carla and Tyrell starts out kind of funny, but when dead bodies start to pile up and he keeps complaining that he hasn't gotten any, I started to roll my eyes so much I was afraid they were going to get stuck. And then Carla spends the entire film trying to get Julie to cheat on her boyfriend. While it seems that Ray and Julie are going through some rough waters, more on that in a minute, Carla is constantly telling Julie to hook up with Will, up until it's revealed that he's the villain. This makes her character really really, really unlikable, and it doesn't make the audience root for her to survive. Although she may have had a point, Ray seems mischaracterized throughout the entire film. In the first film, he went through trauma just like Julie did. When Julie expresses that she's not ready to return home from college, Ray seems to take it as an insult. He's constantly trying to get her to return home with them over the 4th of July weekend. She instead is planning on staying at the school to study and take classes for summer school. Why does Ray suddenly not understand that for the past two years over 4th of July weekend, they've been the worst two years of her life? I mean, they hit a guy on the road and then dumped the body in the ocean to hide their crime. Then the following year, the guy they hit begins stalking her friend group and even kills two of them, one of which was her best friend. Come on, Ray. See, Ray doesn't seem to understand this at all and only sees her refusal to go back to her hometown as a slight against him. But all of this is in the first 15 minutes of the movie. We do learn that he's trying to set up a proposal and this trip to the Bahamas is throwing a wrench in his plan, and his friend convinces him to get over it and go on the trip, but they don't make it before the fisherman kills his friend, so R.I.P. John Hawks. Now this puts Ray outside of the main story for most of the film, which is not a great storyline for his character. Instead, he spends the majority of the film trying to reach the island that the group is on. Not a great use of the main character's boyfriend and one of the survivors of the last film. Having Will be Ben's son also seems like it's copying completely from the reveal of Scream 2 the year before it. Ben's son! A family member coming back for revenge for what happened to the killer's family member in the first film? Come on, that's a mistake that is still being used. I'm looking at you, Scream 6. His dismissal by having him hold a character while his father winds up his hook hand only to have the character step aside and will take the hook in the chest, it's like straight out of professional wrestling and works just about as well as it does there. With all of that being said, how about some positives? After Ben loses his real hand in the last film, he gives himself an upgrade in this film by getting a hook for a hand. He also puts it to good use by dispatching a lot of the movie's characters with it. Olga the maid seems to get it the worst after she's hooked to death and then her body is dragged into an adjacent room. Some of the side characters that aren't annoying is Nancy the bartender. She seems like she's over these annoying teens staying at the hotel but quickly becomes a fun character that even holds her own for a few scenes before she's ultimately dispatched. Friday the 13th Part 2 style, after Estes the voodoo guy, another annoying stereotype, is stabbed with a harpoon and falls on top of her. Ben then shows up to push the harpoon home through Nancy's midsection. Oof. Then horror legend Jeffrey Combs shows up as the hotel manager, Mr. Brooks. No one plays an annoyed character like Combs. He's pretty much built a majority of his career with his annoyed looks and exasperated demeanor. And you know what? No one does it better. 
Overall, the film just doesn't work as a sequel. The characters don't seem to match up with how we left them in the last film, and the new characters don't seem to add anything worthwhile to the plot. This one only draws 3 out of a 10 for us. It's a sloppy follow-up to what was a pretty good slasher. The original was a fun mystery, while this one tries to add in some backstory to the character of the fisherman that just drains any mystery out of him. The misfire of a sequel that killed any momentum for the franchise. A direct to video sequel was released, but none of the surviving characters would return. In recent years, an Amazon series based on the same book would be made. It doesn't feature the fisherman as the villain and wouldn't ultimately capture an audience. And there have been rumblings of doing a new sequel with Jennifer Love Hewitt and Freddie Prinze Jr. interested in reprising their original roles. And with Scream once again being a hot property, maybe it's time the fisherman brought back his hook and slashed his way back onto the big screen. From Joe Blow Horror, keep an eye on the road and hold on to your secrets.